Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was called philosophical medicine, because this perspective acknowledges the idea that the past can influence a person in the present to the person's, uh, <laughs> with the person not being aware of it. That there is such a thing as uh, unconscious motivation affecting the person, and the person may be doing something uh, that's self-defeating uh, or not in their best conscious interests, and they don't know why. Right. So the theory is, um, if there's trauma early on in childhood, um, there's what's called repetition compulsion. The person wants to recreate in the present, thinking that the present is the past, so that and then redo the past in the present so that there wouldn't be a trauma, that they can get through it or something. Um, they're, or they're trying to master the trauma. They say belated mastery. Um, Russell says they want to recreate the safety before the trauma, get that back, and then resume development and keep your feelings. The trauma is that when the baby lost the safety with the mother, uh, he lost his feelings. His golden ball went into the unconscious bag. That's the trauma. He feels uh, that there's something missing, it's painful. Uh, and no one wants to have this unconscious pain. And so that's the unconscious motivation to not let the person feel unconscious pain. So they want to redo that scene in the present uh, to see if they can undo it somehow. It doesn't work. That's why it's called repetition compulsion. Because what's what usually is happening is that the baby um, was born and uh, was meant to latch and, and securely bond with the mother. But some, often that doesn't take place. So the baby doesn't get his symbiosis with the mother. Um, babies come out too early. They need an extended womb. Some babies don't even really enter into the, the extended womb. So they miss out on the symbiosis. So that means even right at birth or shortly afterwards, uh, they lost the safe connection with the mother. That's terrifying for the baby. He thinks he, he, he was abandoned or he's being abandoned. He sacrifices his feelings in the name of what does he have to do instead to please his mother to have the connection. So he can't bother with his feelings. He just has to create an as-if fake uh, false personality to mirror the mother. It doesn't work. It's failed empathy. No baby can mirror the mother or be a parent to the mother or please the mother. Right? So for whatever reason... Due to, um, um, maybe the mother was confused, you know, used the schedule and made the baby cry at night and was misattuned, didn't hold the baby. Maybe the bonding didn't even take place after birth. Uh, Russell and Klaus say that um, in their 1976 book, Maternal Infant Bonding, that if the baby's removed uh, for too long, uh, the hormones dissipate from the mother and they, they lose the connection. Um, so um, that was mentioned earlier. I won't really go into that one there, but they say that it's it's a sensitive, it's a very special, unique, sensitive time uh, at the moment of birth. The mother produces all of these hormones. The baby comes out. They latch. The baby bond, is bonded. He's fused. His body kind of like relaxes and almost melts into the mother. Like he's still kind of um, one with the mother. And that helps the mother to get in, in touch with her ability to be able to understand the baby's signals and respond unconditionally, automatically, just as the baby's needs got met automatically in the biological womb, the uterus, likewise in the extended psychological womb called the stage of social symbiosis, the stage of undifferentiation, the stage of fusion, baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins, this is called the extended womb, likewise the mother's meant to automatically, just in time, unconditionally meet the baby's need, respond what he needs, right? just like they were met in the womb 
in the biological womb, in the extended psychological womb, or this extended second womb. So there are two births, right? Um, he needs to enter into the second womb or the second egg. Right? Now, if that doesn't happen, that's considered a trauma the child can't feel. Uh, the main idea is that the safety with the mother allows the child to feel that it's okay to have his feelings. But if he's terrified with the mother, he thinks he's got to survive, he can't accept his feelings, they go in the golden bag. Uh, they go, the golden ball goes into the bag that we drag behind us. And he just mainly has the, the stress response. Um, in the movie Inside Out, you saw the division there. The stress response is that the fear and the anger character, uh, they were at the console, split off, separated. The joy and sadness characters, uh, they were in deeper in the unconscious, so there was that gap there. Uh, and um, So different kinds of emotions. One is the physiological response to stress emotions, and the other one is the more the feeling emotions, um, with the more wider range, more nuanced and things. So the baby gives up the, the wider range of feelings, like joy, I mean, yeah, so joy, even sadness, gratitude, interest, pleasure, um, etc., wanting to make reparation if they make a mistake, the ability to mourn if they have to mourn. Uh, a lot of a wide variety of emotions are missing. That's the golden ball, it's in the bag. All he has is that console in the movie Inside Out, the fight, flight, and uh, that character discussed, was uh, that rep that's also the physiological, biological side of things. Right? Um, so there's that self-help book by Margaret Paul uh, entitled, Do I Have to Give Up Me? To be loved by you, that's the actual name of the book. And that's basically what baby, what every baby's asking the mother when they're born. The baby comes out, he wants to latch, bond, feel safe and warm and held and connected. Uh, skin to skin contact, no towel, no separation, no shock procedures, you know, barring emergencies and all that. Once again, my disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, a therapist, a nutritionist, none of these things. I'm merely the compiler of the quotes. I love these quotes and I'm... Um, compiling them into this collection and I like to discuss them to share them and to uh, participate and uh, also to understand them myself you know um, so um, the baby uh, thinks wait a minute he has this drive to bond to his mother uh, Fair, Fairbairn he puts it this way he says life force the child's life force all of his energy and motivation his life force is object seeking the first object so that jargon object simply means whatever's important to you emotionally. That's an object. So the, the baby's first object is the breast mother. Um, the theory is, uh, Klein says, the baby doesn't have a full concept of the mother as a full separate person from him. All the baby's relating to really is this blurring around him. He's got the breast there and yes, there's this mass behind. He doesn't fully get it yet. Um, so sometimes that's called part object relating. So let's just, um, so one compromise is the breast mother, right? Um, some people just say it's the breast. You know? um, and later on, he gets that it's the breast mother, then it's the mother. But in the very beginning, uh, the baby expects the breast. They say that the baby even expects innately that the breast is there for him. And many babies want to feed a nurse right automatically, instinctively. They want a nurse right when they're born. So when they come out, they're handed directly to the mother, skin to skin, right? No separation, the cord stays, the placenta stays, it's a natural um, birth called the lotus birth, you know, and um, that preserved the continuity of the womb life. The womb life is meant to be protected. The baby's in the womb, he needs an extended womb for the first three to seven months. On average, four to five months, the baby has to have skin-to-skin -skin contact continuously with the mother, ideally, um, for five months, let's say. And uh, whatever the baby needs, he gets it. He's, he's cold, the mother responds. He's hot, the mother responds. He's hungry, the mother doesn't refuse. Uh, no force feeding. According to the baby's timing, the baby's schedule, the baby's rhythm, the mother's in sync. Oh, she gets it. She can follow the baby. So the mother is a symbiotic object for the baby. It's one-way love. The mother is just giving. Right? The mother shouldn't have some expectation that the baby's supposed to do something special for her, to come for her, to please her. None of this kind of thing. It's all one way, right? So, um, now if there's problems, if the mother is misattuned, malattuned, doesn't get the signals, the baby thinks, wait a minute, my needs are a problem for the mother. 
Well, I better give up my needs. Okay, there goes the golden ball. Then later on, he doesesn't know what he likes or wishes or feelings. Alex Daimia, you know. Um, so um, the baby thinks maybe it's on condition. Oh, I, mother's not available. She's misattuned. Is she angry? Is she going to leave me? Is she, what's wrong? Did I do something wrong? The baby thinks, well, I better figure out what the mother wants to please her. What do you need, mother? What do you want, mother? Um, and uh, it can't be done. The baby can't do that. It's called failed empathy. But he'll try. He'll try to be a perfectionist and a goodest. And he'll sacrifice his, He'll give himself up to seek the love from his mother. He'll, he has to have that bond. Now, if it is frustrating, right, he's bonded to a frustrating, rejecting, refusing mother. That's too painful. How does he feed? He hallucinates instead as an emergency maneuver of the mind called uh, splitting. He's going to hallucinate that he's bonded to a goddess mother to compensate. So he's in his fantasy, he's relating to a wonderful mother, when in reality, he's relating to a misattuned mother. Now this misattuned mother, from the baby's imaginal point of view, um, that's very frightening. And because of the fusion, they're one there, they're blurred there, they're one, undifferentiation symbiosis. If the baby's angry, he thinks that the mother's angry. Now the mother, the mother is this giantess in the nursery. So if the baby's angry, this giant is angry. Now, if the baby wants to take in, he thinks the giant wants to take him in. Now, he can't, he can't feed if he thinks that his mother is a devouring monster who wants to eat him. There's that book called uh, So the Witch Won't Eat Me, and then Hansel and Gretel, it's the, the witch wants to eat the children. Again, myths and fairy tales are metaphors for internal dynamics. Myths and fairy tales describe this imaginal memory world, pre-verbal world. Myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside. They're true on the inside. Myths and fairy tales were the long ago. That was the psychology, child psychology, was it? Uh, Myths and fairy tales describe a baby, a child's trauma, because the main motif describes the main psychological pattern or defense of splitting. Because the myths and fairy tales, it's goddess and demon, it's, it's separate. So the baby creates good mother, bad mother. He's bonded to the bad mother, the devouring witch. He can't accept it. It's denied. He doesn't think it's his mother, actually. He thinks his mother's only loving. That's called splitting. But that's just a temporary maneuver of the mind. By the age of three, uh, assuming that the love with the mother outweighs the frustration with the mother, the two images, the one denied and the fantasized one, they blend together meaning the child gets the idea that the mother is a person who's mostly loving but sometimes frustrating and he can handle or she can handle that ambivalence. Right? But if, if it's the other way around, if the mother is constantly, chronically malattuned, misattuned, the child can't do it. He still uses splitting. Now if in the psychic structure, if in the template, the script, the blueprint inside, if that's work, that internal working model is still like that, that can lead to prejudice and... Um, Splitting precludes differentiation. He doesn't know himself. He can't get the golden ball back. Um, he can't have I'm okay, you're okay relationships. Mutuality's not there. If splitting is still being used, um, that, that's problematic. I won't go into it here, but that's one of our threads um, in this uh, collection of quotes, 1001, Windmills of the Mind, Splitting. Um, it's a, a desperate, very desperate maneuver of the mind the baby adopts to feed safely with his mother when the mother's frightening. He can't accept the reality that the mother is disappointing and frightening and rejecting and terrifying. He can't do that. If he doesn't feed, he's gonna he's not gonna make it. He has to hallucinate that she's all wonderful, then he does it. So he does he tricks himself. So he's a genius that way to survive. He tricks himself. But that's just temporary. By the age of three, splitting is meant to be gone. Existential hearsay. That, that can't continue after three. If it does, there's your prejudice. There's the people with the narcissistic pattern, the bully pattern, the Iago pattern, all these negative philosophies, nihilism, and all of these um, uh, contempt for others. And uh, um, so a lot of the pro any in other words, if a person thinks that they're not okay and others are not okay, like Iago, that's trauma. Splitting is there. Um, if they um, identify with the aggressor, right? Remember, from the baby's point of view, the, the aggressor was painful, but he hallucinates that she's good. So the baby identifies with the aggressor, so he accepts his own fake imagining of the mother being good for himself, and then he says that he's okay. 
Now the mother, from the baby's interpretation, the, the mother believed that the child was not okay. Now the child can't accept the feeling that he was so shamed. That's called the hungry, enraged, empty part self. He can't accept that. Now once that's rep it's in, repressed, when something's repressed, it's seen onto others. So he adopts the mindset that he's fake okay and others are not okay. Now when he says others are not okay, he's talking about himself seen onto others. That's a narcissistic pattern. So he'll, um, to preserve the repression and the denial and the loyalty to the frightening mother. Why is he loyal to the frightening mother? Why can't he just grow, grow up without her? That's the thing. The baby needs the love to leave the mother. If he doesn't get the love, he can't leave the mother. He's stuck there. So to remain loyal to the frightening mother, he's going to be just like her. And while he's being just like her, he's expressing his anger at her. He's going to imitate her because he is her now. He's going to show her up. He's going to say to his mother and mind, look, mother and mind, I didn't like how you didn't give me love. I didn't like how you objectified me and misattuned, or you were misattuned to me and shamed me and I felt hurt. Well, I'm going to find some non-threatening substitute person out there and externally. I'm going to fantasize my innocence onto them. I'm going to be like you. I'm going to shame them to communicate and show you how you shamed me when I was a baby. So through their behavior, they want to communicate how their mother treated them. That's their way to, number one, communicate their childhood to themselves so they can see it as a mirror. Number two, with the fantasy that the mother in the mind will change her ways. Or number three, just to generally see if maybe externally uh, people in the environment might get the mother to change her ways. Something like that. So he's caught in a negative magic gesture. Um, devaluing others to communicate that when he was a baby, he wants to show, he wants to communicate through his behavior that his mother devalued him from him, his point of view when he was a baby. He felt devalued. The mother may have just, maybe she was just on the phone for too long, but the child felt devalued. He thought he was going to be abandoned. Again, the child has no concept of time. He can't think, oh, everything will be okay. In five minutes, she'll come and feed me. He doesn't understand time. There's no time. It's timeless. So he's terrified in that now moment. He needs it now, just in, right, instantly. Right? So that's why um, um, he's so angry at his mother, even though the mother may have done something very trivial from our adult point of view. But from, you got to have empathy from the baby's point of view. From the baby's point of view, if the symbiosis with the mother is broken, uh, he's terrified. He thinks he's going to perish. Right? He needs the symbiosis. He's in the womb. Just think, obviously, if a baby's in the womb, he's not out of, he's out of the womb, he's not going to make it. And uh, in the extended womb, um, psychologic, from a uh, psychological point of view, emotional, spiritual point of view, he loses all of that if that symbiosis is broken, even though he can biologically survive afterwards or just with the food but that's that's a pitiful miserable feeling um to not receive mother's love right and uh, because you need mother's love to know yourself kind of thing right? um so um why don't i just take a peek outside here hold on a sec how are we doing today you know it was a little too uh although it's clear today it's quite windy, and uh, it's about 8 degrees or something. So I had to come back in. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I tried earlier to do this video outdoors. I, I, had, I could, It was way too windy. Even, a little, even if there's a little wind, the, the, this phone is so sensitive. It, it picks it up, you know. You can see, you can see the leaves sort of still flopping around. Yeah, it's still quite windy. Oh yeah, yeah. See, it's still very windy. Yeah. I like doing these videos outdoors because if there's a bird flying by, I can show you, or, or if there's a bee or something, I can show you. <laughs> it's just an excuse for me to calm down a little bit. Right? Um, 
yeah, a lot of this material is emotional sometimes i do i feel myself a little um unconsciously triggered sometimes um but like they like he said the truth will upset you free right? so we're, we're trying to make this conscious so back to repetition compulsion the main trauma is that the baby lost the bond meaning the secure bond the safe bond okay right if the baby loses the safe bond his feelings are gone his identity is gone we feel therefore we are if he loses his feelings he doesn't really have a sense of self ontological security sense of you know, he, he loses that kind of a um, connection to himself um, so that's a trauma repetition compulsion he, he wants to recreate the scene of the crime in the present to undo it somehow it can't be done so he tries again because life force is object seeking right? he wants to recreate a certain level of safety so, so that he can get his feelings back um, or like in the movie groundhog day if the person can have an authentic relationship with somebody make I statements, be vulnerable and sincere, uh, that can heal repetition compulsion. So there, are, so the theory is, up to this point, there are two ways uh, to heal repetition compulsion. Through uh, authentic dialogue with someone, a therapist, a friend, um, or if there's a marriage, after the honeymoon phase, because they, they recreate the symbiosis in the honeymoon phase, that's why they're so excited and get married, because they have that fusion there, but somebody's going to hatch out early. After the honeymoon phase, if they then enter therapy, their marriage can be like a spiritual path, a psychological growth path. So um, for more information about repetition compulsion, uh, TQ2119 by Russell. That's the main, that's it there. And actually the three videos that followed that video uh, were sort of follow-up were follow-ups to it. So from TQ2119 up to TQ2129, 2119 to 2129. Uh, if you're just gonna watch only one topic or study only one topic in 1001 Windmills of the Mind, I would go with that one. Because if you can understand repetition, compulsion, you don't, you don't, you might not, you can make little changes, you can improve. You might not completely heal, but you can, it's, it's, it's a relief to have some awareness of what's going on. Uh, um, if we're not aware, if we're not aware of why we're repeating, we're just going to repeat. We're going to keep on repeating until we know why. Repetition compulsion is an attempt to find our memories. If we don't have memories, then we repeat. So either we repeat and don't know what's going on, then we repeat and don't know why we're doing this, or we get some sense of what, what's happening, right? For example, we lost the bond, lost the feelings, trying to recreate it. If we have some sense of why we're doing it, make the unconscious conscious, uh, then we don't need to repeat. So either we understand and, and have some, get some memories, get some feelings around it, uh, we don't need to repeat anymore, you see? Once we're conscious, we don't need to repeat unconsciously something, right? Um, in the last video, the one just made yesterday, the one ending in um, 2145, that video there, it, it was an outdoor video. Um, again, it was windy, and I played a video clip from uh, Kristen Wilson. She made a little speech there, and I played it back, and it was a little too windy. You can still hear it, but I, I thought it might, maybe it's a little too distracting. So I'd like to just play it again. It's a very good speech by she's a like a theater teacher, drama like a like a therapy using um, theater for therapeutic purposes. Uh, she's a theater theater director, um, you know, cares about things and healing and and so on. So she gave a little speech at some kind of conference uh, called the Bioneers Conference about the environment and all that. So her speech is called "Ooh My Soul," and. Um, that's a good speech. Um, so I'll, I'll play it now. And, um, you know, uh, she calls her speech a mammon. She says it's not a sermon. Because, sir, sir, well, well we, let's support women. Let's not, let's not. So she says she wants to give not a sermon, but a mammon. 
to support women. Um, and her main message is that um, it's disembodied discourse that's causing problems. It's disembodied discourse, not knowing our feelings. Or dis that's why we repeat something dysfunctional. Greed is dysfunctional. Envy is dysfunctional. Right? Because we're not feeling. If we feel we're not greedy or repetition, none of these things take place anymore. When we have our feelings, that's psychological birth. That's I'm okay, you're okay. Whole object relations. Greed is uh, you don't care about others. And, uh, what kind of thing. So, and she says um, the conclusion was um, if we can get to the place where we can feel, oh, uh, that's huge. That, that's huge. We've, we've healed ourselves, our environment, and, and so on. Um, the problem is that we're not feeling. Um, it's disembodied discourse that has gotten us into this uh, confusion and repetition, compulsion, and being greedy and selfish and all of these things. So that was one of her messages. And, um, so let, let's just play it. Um, Okay, why not just do Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here to discuss what must, if we shall succeed, be a spiritual revolution. An evolution from Homo sapien sapien, revealingly redundant, to Homo economicus, well put, Matt Oschliger. I will proceed directly to the heart of my sermon, which, for the sake of revolutionary gender reclamation, I drop the sir and add a ma'am, making this not a sermon, but a mammon. Yes! Yes, Buchanan, I said mammon, which speaks to the natural and pantheistic instead of the mechanical and sadistic. We are talking about exchanging biopornography for biophilia. Pornography. That is the structure of domination which has replaced English as our national language. Everything translated into what I can possibly control or consume without being touched, changed, challenged, or connected. <laughs> A language which transforms women into meat, animals into meat products, poor men into machines, and rich men into gods. But in their attempts to become gods, they have lost their souls. We all have. That is why I am up here preaching my mammon. God did not throw us out of Eden. Brothers and sisters, we are throwing ourselves out every industrious day. <laughs> the apple Eve ate was good. Sweet. <laughs> but what about the apples now with their red, shiny, pesticidal coverings? Satan in the shape of Monsanto. But it's okay. <laughs> can afford organic. I am single, white, educated. I don't have children to feed. There will be poor with us always. Let them eat the pesticide riddle fruit. Ha! Joke. Riddle. On us. Genocide continues. Organic for the rich. Toxic. Tap water for the poor. We have a lot of work to do if this re-evolution is really going to happen and save us. So, let us talk about salvation. And I do not mean a peach smoothie and a massage. I am talking about saving this planet and the people with it. How will we be saved? The environmental catastrophe appears overwhelming. We are afraid we cannot think our way out of this mess. Of course not. We must feel our way out. We must learn to listen with our hearts and our hands. If you are not in your body, you are not making sense. Literally. <laughs> it is disembodied discourses that have got us into this crisis. We have 
exploring the earth for short-sighted economic profit is intelligent, reasonable, then please, God, make me a moron! <laughs> this is a spiritual revolution about finding our ways back to the land, finding ways to be fed, spiritually fed. And it is not easy. <laughs> I know, I know. I myself have strategized on ways to make my plans fit their pathology. I have walked through the shadow of political expedience. <laughs> Once I had a had a campaign to I thought I'd do this whole campaign about changing the environmental reference to this earth from Mother Earth to Father Planet. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I read all those, you know, those bumper stickers that were out, you know, those with the green earth globes that said, love your mother. And I despaired. <laughs> I knew there was no hope. <laughs> and I'm not even referring to the irony of having pro-planet language on the back of a car. <laughs> to the slogan, love your mother. It won't work. What America hates its mothers. I thought of Mother's Day and the men who give the mother of their children sentimental harlequin cards, then beat, rape, and silence them the other 364 days. No, I thought. No wonder we have an environmental crisis if we treat the earth the way we treat our mothers. <laughs> Woo, we think mothers are made to be exploited. They are supposed to give and give and ask nothing in return. They are supposed to have infinite resources. All good mothers are willing to be drained, damned, and depleted for their children. Mothers live for their baby's feeding schedule, and there is always a little milk left for Exxon Texaco International Paper and the U.S. military. I mean, I thought, but if, if nature was perceived as male, then maybe everything would be different. Think about it. I mean, it might not be nice to fool Mother Nature, but if you mess with Father Planet, he'll beat the shit out of you. Hail, hurricane and all. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then maybe environmentalists would get the respect they deserve. No longer mamas, boys, and girls. Maybe they would be treated like real men and the real women who love real men. <laughs> A name changed to Father Planet is not enough. Fathers and mothers, we both need to be saved if this planet is going to survive. The environmental crisis points to a total ideological and spiritual crisis. Including the earth and the economic equation is not enough. We are destroying the earth for reasons that are bigger than economics. You see, we are afraid of death. We are afraid of this earth, this nature that will bring us back to dust. We are afraid of the dust and the dirt that will claim us, or the waters that we came from, and thus afraid of women's bodies, the bridges by which we walk this earth. An intellectual atheist performance artist in spiritual crisis wrote this sermon. <laughs> because this revolution is about a religion in one of its original meanings relinking, reconnecting <laughs> the lives of women raped and murdered daily are fought in this struggle the lives of indigenous peoples are fought in this struggle the men and women lost in the empty addiction of power. These infantile gods will grow into their souls if we win. We must win. If, if the pioneers had a man of this destiny to 
decolonize, control, and consume, then the pioneer should have a man-buff-best destiny <laughs> to decolonize, create, and commune. But this must be a spiritual revolution, not just the environment separate and distinct from its home and all and everything. You see, if this is a spiritual revolution, if we get to feel as we fight, if we just get to feel as we fight, then we have already won. Amen. A women. A planet. Our soul. Okay, so she was sort of linking the inner, the inner and the outer. Um, I'm not really playing it for the environmental message per se, but I want to focus on. Um, the, the main point, she's saying that if we're not feeling, if, we're, if we lost our feelings because we lost a safe bond with the mother, so there's the anger at the mother, you see. Now remember, when the baby's with the mother, they're in an omnipotent dual unity. The baby's in a blissful oneness with the mother, at the breast mother. They're one there. The baby doesn't pay attention to what's around him. Think about lovers uh, in the honeymoon period. They're not too concerned about things around them. They're just focused on each other. They're in this blissful, you know, two as one, you know, two bodies, one soul. Uh, we can do everything. We're so powerful. Mana. Uh, what's it? Yesterday was Wakonda. They feel an immense uh, pleasure and power to be... Um, they're, they're reliving what the baby bl blissfully felt in the Garden of Eden in the womb and post-womb for the first five months. Uh, in the honeymoon phase, uh, they're basically experiencing an adult version of that. So they're very focused on themselves. Now think about it. If there's greed, that means the, there was a problem with the breastfeeding. Right? Uh, and the, the secure connection was broken. Now what does the baby understand that he needs? He needs an inexhaustible flow of goodness towards him. Unconditional flow of goodness towards him. So he's not caring about the other environment. It's just between him and his mother. Two-person psychology, him and his mother, right? So if that's missing, uh, he's going to chase for that for the rest of his life in a repetition compulsion called greed. Right? So anything in the present is symbolic mother. He wants to consume it in. But nothing in the present is the actual mother, so it doesn't work. It's a one-time deal. Development from birth to three is a one-time go. It's a one-time deal. You can't still try to get those unmet needs met after post age three. If you do, that's called greed, envy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude, hostile mind, power and control, prejudice. All of that complicated uh, negative uh, stuff is going on because they're still trying to get what they didn't get. That leads to, and it doesn't work. So it's repetition compulsions. So they seek more power and control. Right? Uh, they want to control someone else to be a surrogate, a surrogate symbolic breast and be fed by it. So greed, that's why they're always taking in. Remember, the baby, the breast just takes in. The baby doesn't have to give or do something. So if there's trauma there, the person becomes, that's the narcissistic pattern. They're greedy, the bully pattern, Iago's, envy and greed, and all of these difficult persons, right? So, um... So she's saying there that uh, about she talked about infantile gods. Okay, so the baby thinks he's a little god in the womb. It's called hallucinatory, unconditional omnipotence. He's a little god. Everything, all of his needs get automatically met. Post womb, this continues in the extended womb, and actually between five months and eighteen months, that's still there. So when the baby is starting to crawl and walk, up until the age of eighteen months, he still thinks everything around him is to serve him. He still thinks he's a little god. It's all about him. The world is his oyster, and etc. He doesn't have. He doesn't say thank you for. He doesn't have gratitude or 
or she, um, it's st he's still in that state where he thinks he's a little god. If there's trauma there prior to the age of 18 months, then they become the infantile god she's talking about, right? Uh, that's why people with the narcissistic pattern and other patterns around that time, uh, the main emotions are hate, greed, envy, grenvy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude, power and control. Um, they, they, you know, gratitude and affection and tenderness, sweetness, um, any kind of, um, um, you know, wanting reparation, apology, to say, uh, to feel regret and remorse and sadness and apology, these things don't exist. Uh, not really, right? Karen Hornai might uh, interject here, but uh, we're just speaking in broad, broad terms here. I don't mean to sound glib, but I have to start sort of somewhere, right? Again, like Robert Bly says, uh, these are all ballpark approximations. These theories, these these are all approximations. There's no clear-cut uh, theory yet, right? It's not, psychoanalysis is not a, a fixed science or anything like that, right? Um, so the theory is that the, the baby's just in receiving mode at the beginning. He doesn't give back. There's no two-way back and forth relationship. It's pretty much one way. Um, now, if the baby's stressed out, he'll make a gesture. The mother responds. But from the baby's point of view, he just commanded the mother to respond to him because he's a little god, a little king. He's a little infantile god. So he, that's, that's called um, omnipotence of thought, omnipotence of gesture. He makes a... He shakes his rattle, the mother responds. Oh, he, he thinks he created it. That the mother's just there to serve him. The mother's just this otherness that serves him. He doesn't have a concept of him being a separate person with feelings in his own right, and the mother's a separate person with a psychology in her own right, and a world in her feeling world in her, in her own right. Uh, he just thinks it's all about him. That's the narcissistic pattern. They think it's all about them. Now remember, because of the fusion, in the mind, they're blurred with the mother, so the mother's him. So people with the narcissistic pattern will often say they're so important and it's all about them. Right? Because that's the baby state be before 18 months with the fusion. Right? Now, um, and um, So caring for others is not there. So she was talking about the greed. Um, actually, I recently... Uh, Bought a bag of potato chips. Um, on the on the package itself, it said that uh, was it forty percent of all food is just wasted. They don't care. Forty percent of all food just gets chucked. And I thought, well, why don't you just put it on a some plane or boat or send it or something? At least do that or something. I said, well, why? Everything's there to serve them. They don't have to give. So that's the baby mentality. Everything's to receive, right? Uh, they don't give. Right? Um, you don't hear babies saying thank you or giving. It. They're all in receiving mode. So if there's a tr if the baby didn't receive the love he needed, okay, he's going to spend the rest of his life in a repetition compulsion to replay and recreate that traumatic interaction with the mother in the present. That's called greed. Now, ultimately, his positive intention is to find some kind of secure connection with someone, have a genuine relationship. But it can't be done. Uh, then he gets his feelings, then he's no, no longer greedy. So that's Wilson's main message. If we get our feelings, we're good, right? Uh, we feel, therefore we are. That's I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, um, so I thought I would um, follow this up since we're redoing it with uh, some of Faber's work here. Um, Faber, 2118. Uh, that's, uh, we did some quotes by um, Mel D. Faber. So we'll do a couple of Faber's quotes here. Okay, so um, this first one here. Okay, uh, famous author here, Roheim, is it? Geza, I think. Roheim or something. Okay, this author stresses the critical connection between money and its tie to the mother, particularly with regard to possessing the needed mother. Quote, a lean upon another person means that you can, at your will, convert him into a giver. Okay. The, the inability to control the mother was the most significant defeat in childhood. So, the power desired is power that fulfills magically an infantile or fantastic transitional need for control of the maternal figure and of her later substitutes. 
quote, an effort to internalize the maternal object. Okay, so the baby couldn't internalize a positive experience of the mother. That's missing. So psychic structure is missing. He doesn't have memories of the loving mother. The baby needs memories of the loving mother to have his feelings. If he doesn't have those memories of interacting with the loving mother, he doesn't have those feelings. So that's a trauma, repetition, compulsion. He's going to... Um, so money, material, matter, all links to mother. They all share the same common root word mat for mother. It all traces. So material, matter, money, uh, all links back to mother. So if, if a person... Um, so in the unconscious fantasy, any kind of helpful thing out there, like money or goods, um, they want it in, in the attempt to have positive memories with the mother. They want to take in mother's positive memories in inside. But the car and the, the refrigerator or what the thing you buy, it doesn't do that. You're disappointed. It didn't work. But you're still left with that repetition compulsion to try to heal from that ancient memory from, from the nursery. So you try again. It didn't work. And you're not conscious of it. So you try, you try harder and, and it didn't, didn't work. So greed can be, so one theory about greed is it's, it's this idea here. You're trying to internalize memories of the maternal object. It can't be done. Nothing in the present, no person in the present is the breast mother. Nothing, no material thing, no cookie, no food, no delicious dinner, uh, no expensive thing you buy uh, is, is, um, <laughs> It's going to be regarded in your as the breast or something. It's not going to work. Those things uh, um, are addictive in a sense because uh, when a person does get something, if it's a good, it's status. If it's food, it's uh, sugar. The mammalian brain feels safer. So the person gets serotonin by the thing they get. So greed gives the person serotonin. Okay, Getting the thing preserves your infantile megalomania that everything's about you. You know, you bought, remember the, um, we had a quote about um, the muffins, Marion Woodman. She said, uh, the person bought the muffin and the muffin has magic power. And they bought the muffin and they, uh, you know, uh, unpacked it or whatever. And um, they consumed it and they felt a little better. And the act of buying the muffin and holding the muffin and have the ritual around the muffin, that made them feel like the muffin was a magic wand. That made them feel like they're infantile, they're, that they're an infantile god again, infantile megalomania. Then they get then the sugar, salt, and fat tricks the brain to send the person serotonin. That's the baby would feel serotonin with the memories, with, but the baby the baby didn't get that safety with the mother. So later on they eat the cookies uh, to trick the brain. So that's synthetic sweetness. So again. The, the baby wants tenderness or sweetness from the mother. He never got that. So later on, he looks for some kind of synthetic substitute in an attempt to get what he didn't get or to communicate that he didn't get it. So he eats the cookie. It, all it does is trick the brain to send the person serotonin. The body metabolizes it. It's gone. You can do it again. It's gone. You do it again. It's, it's Sisyphus. So it doesn't work. So that's so greed it comes from this repetition compulsion of still searching for mother's connection, hence getting your feelings. The goal is to get our golden ball back. Without mother's love, we lose our golden ball. So that's Robert Bly's story about Iron John. We got to get the golden ball. Uh, the, this motif is also in the frog prince. The golden ball was in the well. Remember, the frog had to bring it up. Uh, so we have to get up. Um, the golden ball, the frog, Robert Bly's take of it was that uh, the, sh the frog uh, was a symbol for shame. It's dirty and uh, not dirty, uh, it's, it's wet. And I'm not sure how, we, I forgot how we described it, but the frog was uh, some kind of link to shame. So if you face your shame and you accept your shame, that's a very sad thing. You can start to get the golden ball up. Uh, and then the frog, the, the woman had to be angry at the frog. Um, then, so the so you felt your your grieving, um, you felt the shame, you're angry. Then you get your golden ball back. Right? So the frog becomes a prince. The prince is a metaphor for the woman's uh, missing traits, and for a man, the princess is the feminine side. So in that speech by Wilson, she said, "We want to get the feminine principle: feelings, receptivity, caring, psychological birth." Right? Um, You see, in greed, they, they don't care about time. 
Remember the baby, it's in a timeless state. So greed, they're just living in the past. The past is timeless. So people who are so focused on greed, they're just operating out of the emotionality memory template, the template, the reference point. The puppet master is timeless. So they're operating out of the, the puppet master who doesn't have a concept of time. So people who are greedy are operating out of a timeless state. So they don't, they're oblivious to the effects. So her speech there, they're oblivious to the effects of uh, the environment and all that. Right? because they're in a timeless state um, so that's another thing that uh, in the unconscious it's timeless right um, repetition compulsion is in reference point to a time when there was no time so they're repeating it and they have no concept of time so they're repeating it over and over again like sisyphus um, so again uh 21 i can't do it justice here 21 19 to 21 29 uh, please refer to well, those those quotes. I feel like maybe that wasn't too bad. If you read the quotes from 2119 to 2129, if you just read the quote, you don't have to listen to me babble on about it. If you just read those quotes, I'm confident uh, you might get an aha there. I, I did. I got a real aha uh, from that, from those 10 quotes there. Um, I found it very helpful. 2119 to 2129. And Faber is 2118, also very helpful. So back to Faber here. Okay, so let's so let's go back to greed for a minute. Okay, greed. So let's just say he's greedy. Let's call him the greedest. The greedest's opium, right? They're hit. Right? So remember, um, the baby at the breast, uh, he gets oxytocin, serotonin. So that's the hit. Right? So the cookie gives the person a release of serotonin. That's a hit, but it um, it doesn't last, so they got to do it again and again, right? Okay, so uh, the greatest um, uh, daily repetition compulsion is the same today it was before. Today, however, he makes sure of his, quote, supply to not suffer the interruption of his habit. Okay. So what can happen is with greed, if a person's greedy, they may form a symbiosis with the things that's providing them the supply. So they're one with the things that they're having. So the constant taking in and the shopaholic and the foodaholic or caraholic or whatever, whatever they're constantly getting in all the time, they can be fused at the breast with that. So if there's an interruption, that would, that would trigger the abandonment depression the baby felt when he lost the bond with the mother. Right. And yesterday, we had a quote about the uh, Lamborghini. Check that one out from yesterday, about the Lamborghini. Um, the baby was fused at the breast, but the, the bond was broken. The baby felt terrified. Okay, Fast forward, the, buy, the, the guy bought an expensive car. He fused with the car. He said he was one with the car. The car and him are one. He responds, the car responds, just like, He's the car, and the car is him. He, he, he said he created that kind of fusion there. And then he found a slight flaw with the car, and he was enraged. He wanted to destroy the car and all this stuff. So what happened? So the author was saying, that's a break in the symbiosis. The, uh, the break in the original symbiosis from babyhood time got triggered. So the present event of something uh, that broke the, the fusion, him and the car were fused, something um showed the guy that he didn't didn't have the perfect oneness there with the car it was a little thing that was off logically you wouldn't get so upset but it triggered the original timeless painful memory of broken at the at the with the fusion there remember if the baby's not fused with the mother he feels he's being abandoned exiled terrified all of those pain gets in the goes in the bag he can't accept it right? he spends the rest of his life trying to get his golden ball back so maybe the greed is similar. You're fused in a symbiosis with the money and the, the, all the, the portfolio or whatever it is, all, all, the, all the, the constant supply, right? So there can be a fusion there with the, with, the, with the products that the greed is getting. Now, so this was the same in the past as it is today. So without anxiety, one can rest from created... Okay, so now in the plunder... Okay, so greed is... You want to create poverty. 
Okay, so the the people, the greedists, want to invent, uh, want to get others in a poor position. Now, if others are in poverty, and they're like a pool of poorly paid workers doing all the work and all that, they're going to hand over the goods, right? So, without anxiety, he can rest from the created, his created, the po the poverty created by the greed, the substance that's the material, the goods, the money, the substance that serves as surrogate for the lost primary object. So the money is a surrogate, is a symbol for mother. Okay, so the 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 dollar. The, uh, uh, the money in whatever form it is, uh, that's a symbol for mother. Okay, so the prof. So okay, so what what is he doing here? So he's making all of this profit, this continuous flow. He wants to control time. He wants to control the future. He wants to control the breast. Make the breast steady. Make the breast reliable, steady, unreliable flow of maternal supply, mother's soothing presence, milk, etc. And fill the emptiness with mother's presence. Okay? These appear to be the major goals of, quote, the system. Okay, so I'm going to link this to our uh, sub thread. Okay, this 1001 windmills of the mind is not about external, the environment and the system and things like It's not about that. But what happened was. Um, we have a thread. So again, we have 50 threads here. One of the threads is, is the um, psychology of uh, prejudice. Um, with trauma, he was shamed, he can't accept it, he sees it onto others, identifies with the aggressor, shames others to communicate that he, he was shamed, or he sees his rejecting mother onto others, innocent others, and says how bad they are. So we talked about when you coax others to play roles, and then you're stuck like... So prejudice can come from sort of from personal trauma. Childhood trauma can lead to prejudice. But we had a quote maybe eight months ago where the guy said, um, no, you're being too one-sided. What about the sociological factors? S social Sociology can lead to individual prejudice. And I hesitated and I thought, yeah, I, I'm, I'm being, that's splitting. I, I only think about the internal. What about the external? I didn't, I never really wanted to go there, but, and I resisted it for almost over a year. I didn't talk about anything external, um, so um, so we started a sub-thread to uh, our main thread on prejudice. And the sub-thread is uh, called the sociological factors that contribute to prejudice. Now, this sociological factor, um, there are several points to it. Uh, one point is that the theory that for 100, for 1 million years, Okay, um, for what, one theory is that for one million years, we were this guy. Meet Homo bodoensis. So before we were Homo sapiens, or, or Wilson says Homo naturalis, we were this guy. We were him. Before we became us, we were him. This is an older version of us. So we all came from him. You see, and then 150,000 years ago, he evolved the neocortex, the insula, the hippocampus, right? The frontal lobes and all that. So, you know, memory and sense of self and, uh, and uh, language, language is up here, right? So he evolved this 150,000 years ago. So 150,000 years ago, Homo bodoensis uh, evolved to Homo sapien. And then, okay, then he spread around the world, maybe because there was uh, ice or weather, I, for whatever reason, he decided to leave Africa and he, he moved around all over the place. And then he settled in different areas. Some settled in the north, some stayed, some settled east, west, south, north, they, they moved around the globe, okay? And then... Uh, because of the food conditions and the weather conditions and maybe the lifestyle that, that they adopted to accommodate the environment, there were some trivial biological variations that took place. We're all one species. We're all Homo sapiens. We're all one. We're all one right? um, the reason there's some trivial biological variations is because maybe the ones who went to the north, uh, maybe because the sun... Uh, Right, it's colder there, so they didn't. So they lost their tan, 
the ones who stayed in the hot areas, uh, they needed the tan um, to, to get used to the sun or something like that. Um, now, maybe in some areas, uh, they had to be... Uh, they had to be, uh, uh, maybe they had to be more communal and cooperative in in in, the, in uh, raising the crops. So in some some areas they developed a more sort of a cooperative personality, like a peaceful get along with each other. Uh, they said in Tahiti uh, they got the fish. The fish were in the lagoon, so they were very peaceful by that. But some people had to go out deep into the ocean with the big waves, so some people became a little more rugged by it. Now, if some people ate more milk and meat, maybe the maybe they got uh, uh, taller or something. Uh, so there were some trivial biological variations, but underneath the trivial, trivial, they call it the frills. So there were some frills, right? Maybe he, so. Melanin is, is melanin is the chemical related to the color of your hair, skin, and eyes, right? So that's a frill. It's just a superficial thing, right? Um, so the frills are on the out, superficial outside, but underneath the frills, we're all him. We're all an advanced version of him. We're all Homo boduensis plus this, called Homo sapiens. So we're all him underneath. We're all this underneath, right? Plus the this. So. Um, and then 150,000 years ago, okay, so so he was there for a million years, and then 150,000 years ago, he he morphed into Homo sapiens, and then he moved around, and then there were little variations, and then, okay, so okay again, so for 100 150,000 years or 200,000 years or whatever it is, all babies got a secure attachment style, the temperament, the natural normal normal, natural, healthy temperament of Homo sapiens is, I'm okay, you're okay. It's called a tolerant personality because all babies were loved. All babies got a secure, safe, warm attachment style because the mother held the baby the whole time. The mother was attuned, knew the baby's needs. The mother had that rhythm with the baby. And uh, Klaus and Kennel was saying, if by chance a mother didn't, the whole community was very aroused by it because they didn't want some very traumatized baby because he'll grow up and be destructive and all that, right? So they, they um, were very sensitive to this issue of making sure that every baby was uh, raised properly, right? So for 150,000 years, all babies got a secure attachment style. I'm okay, you're okay. The tolerant personality, the temperament of Homo sapiens was the adult temperament. The way you think of a natural, healthy adult, a genuine adult, right? warm, uh, safe, uh, generative, uh, maybe confident or um, playful, like a, a healthy, safe adult, like a good adult, right? We don't see them too often, uh, it seems, right? That was the norm called a tolerant personality. I'm okay, you're okay. In, in, the, in the jargon here, it's called whole object relations and the psychological birth. So... There were no, there were, there was no prejudice or s cynical humor, or sardonic humor, shaming humor. There were no uh, horrible, um, there were no massacre. There were no vi severe, violent things. There were these occasional little arguments about jealousy, maybe, uh, but nothing, but no major, serious, over-the-top things. Uh, there were some little things she talked about, but nothing too major. The, the worst they got, we got, was jealousy. There was no envy. Jealousy, you're a little angry, but you're okay. Your sense of self is still there. Envy means you don't have your sense of self, so you're more enraged. right? So envy and uh, Wilson says sadism, these kinds of cruel, violent, these things weren't there. right? So um, Homo sapiens lived... Uh, in a, we, maybe we could say with a tolerant personality, it was a kind of global village. People cooperated. Right? Um, people traded and cooperated, right? and um, and people were playful. They were they had a long life. Apparently, they had very healthy. There were no no problems with their health. They lived apparently a long long life. No uh, no dental problems. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, no, um, maybe there was no baldness, I don't know, 
Um, so they, they were healthy, they had a long life. Um, and then something happened. 100, uh, 10, 000, roughly 10,000 years ago, um, Homo sapiens discovered farming and agriculture, that they can grow food. That was a huge, that was a momentous event. That's like a major invent, discovery. Then the mammalian part of the brain sent people serotonin. The brain adjusted to this new level of serotonin expectation. Again, the theory about serotonin is, uh, it's just described in L Loretta Brunning's three books, Meet Your Happy Chemicals, I Mammal, and Beyond Cynicism. Those three books are very short, easy to read. They explain about uh, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. Right? Theory is, um, when the organism, when a mammal, a person, animal, when somebody gets something that the mammalian part of the brain interprets that it'll help the person to be safer, the, the chemistry is serotonin. The, the brain sends the person serotonin. It's a feel-good chemical because you feel safe. Because the mammalian brain, according to the psychology around it, is going to interpret something in relation to the, the psychodynamics, in relation to the memories, it's going to send the person serotonin. So 10,000 years ago, people found fa farming. The mammalian brain said, whoa, all of this free abundant food? Wow, this is huge. And then the brain adjusted to that. Now, when the brain adjusted to that, Bruning, uh, Bruning part of me says that... Um, what if there what if there were a weather problem and people didn't get that abundant unlimited food supply all of a sudden well then they, maybe they panicked yeah. um, now out of the panic they thought they better expand the farms and, and hoard it or something or so that was the birth of a economic model he called it a global uh, pill, uh, pillage so we went from global village to global pillage so Wilson said, we went from homo naturalis to homo economicus. So we went to homo, so we regressed to a traumatized version of ourselves called homo economicus. Now, in order to um, pillage, um, the idea is someone's got to do all the labor and the farming and the, cut the trees down and do all the, all the work and all that. But it's not really natural to force others against their will to do that. People were cooperative and people were um, treated, treated each other in an I'm okay, you're okay way. Uh, the temperament was uh, friendly and warm. You wouldn't, you wouldn't treat people badly like that. So the, but there was a panic, they said. Out of this panic, someone said, oh my God, how are we going to get people to... They, they said, um, we got to get people to do all the work and how are we going to do this? So they invented the idea, wait a minute, everybody has a tolerant personality. What if we invented the prejudiced personality, the us and them mindset? And I guess they, they thought, well, how do you do that? Oh, that's not our nature. Well, that's awful. Who wants to do that? No, but we're in this manic panic. What if the, what if the crops, uh, what if it's too cold and the crops don't, cr Some, something like that. So, the, so out of the manic panic, they got the idea called, quote, suffer the children. When the babies were born, instead of letting the mother hold the baby, they yanked the baby away, put him some far off place, and the baby's traumatized. He's enraged. That, that leads to the prejudiced personality because the baby's going to hallucinate that he's good, that the mother's good and he adopts that fake hallucinated image of mother being good for himself so he says he's okay but in reality he felt shamed by the mother now if he feels shamed by the mother he can't accept that he's going to see it on to others now he's in battle with the mother in the mind okay so now he's going to see his unloved self onto others and say look mother in the mind you didn't you shamed me at birth you didn't protect me from those people who yanked me away from you. You, you it's your fault, mother in the mind. You, I broke the you broke the bond with me, and um, so I was shamed by you, mother in the mind. I'm gonna, uh, I, mother in the mind. I, I didn't like that. 
but I got to communicate it to you somehow. I don't have words, so I'm going to show you through behavior. I want to get you to change your ways. I want to show you what you did to me. I want you to correct it. So I got to show you what you did to me first. You see that innocent other persons over there, a group or whatever, people by the across the river. All, I'm going to say they're so bad. I'm going to be shaming and negative towards them. I'm going to because I want to communicate the dynamic of what happened between us. When I was a baby, you rejected me. I felt rejected. I thought you were good and you made me feel no good. I'm going to imitate you. I'm going to think that I'm good. I'm going to see my real self onto the innocent others and I'm going to say that they're no good. So mother and I, mind, I'm going to have the mindset that I'm good and they're no good. That's called the prejudice personality. That's in them. Now, with that psychology, um, they say others... They say others can do the work. They don't care about them because they're in fusion with the mother. Remember, the baby at the breast, it's just the two of them. They don't care about others. So they don't care about the, the, the others out there, right? So now the others are in the... Now the others become the them now. Us and them. Now they that leads to the pool of poorly paid workers. They do all the work. I let a, a, huge, a huge tragedy. A dark chapter in... Homo sapiens is history, obviously. Right? Immense poverty and suffering and, um, and the greed and the plunder and just kept on going like this, right? And uh, and repetition compulsion, the greed continues. And, you know, now or now, um, you know, I'm posting this video in the year uh, 2022 and, um, you know, prices are going up and things. So you see it... it, 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 it um, I'm not going to go into to the details about current events. I, I want to understand psychology here uh, about prejudice and how the sociological side. I have to acknowledge the sociological side to some degree to get to the point where we can understand prejudice. Right? So the sociological side was there was this manic panic to manufacture the prejudice personality so that some people will think that they're good and those same people will think that others are not good. And then those people will be used to get others in a in a disadvantaged position. They do all the work. They do all, and then all the greed comes in you know, to the prejudiced personality side. Now Faber and um, but but uh, but people are always trying to heal from trauma, so they invented religion to block healing. Religion says don't heal. Okay, religion says. Uh, came up with a trick. So, the baby was blissfully happy at the breast. Religion says, are you stressed out? Imagine the breast in the sky. Let's call it a goddess. Imagine you're one with it. That this goddess breast, goddess, loves you, protects you, is one with, and you feel, and the religion tries to trigger what you felt as a baby, or in the womb even, that blissful, at, everybody felt that bliss at some time in their lives, either in the womb or shortly after the womb. Okay. So, but we forgot it. Religion is about triggering the feeling that the blissful feeling that you had, but forgot. Now, if you can trigger it, and now you're conscious, and you feel some of it, and you get a taste of it, you go, "Wow, this is amazing!" You feel powerful, heavenly. This is amazing. This is the Garden of Eden again. Right? So that's called religion, where you consciously. Uh, feel what you felt but forgot and that's the gambit and then uh, they don't want to make you conscious of it they just want to trigger the good feeling that you felt as a baby so they say okay imagine the breast in the sky but they don't use the word breast in the sky they say oh there's some powerful uh, invisible power who loves you and serves and protects you is always there and you go really wow that's great that's what that's the relationship of the baby to the breast just like that so religion was invented to, Faber calls it the infantilizing process. Keep people in that traumatized, infantilized, infantilized state because that means they're still going to maintain the us and the them. Religion, the purpose of religion is to preserve the us and the them. Right? To, create, to preserve the prejudiced personality because the prejudiced personality is what's needed to pillage and plunder, right? Um, so religion doesn't want to want to make you conscious of it. 
So they get everybody focused on this activity of uh, re-experiencing the blissful moment that you forgot. And just, just do that every That distracts you. That takes your time and energy away from healing yourself. So um, they're, they're trying to prevent healing because uh, they want to keep uh, the panic mode mentality. Homo sapiens still seem to be in this kind of a, maybe not, maybe it's better. I, I don't, it seems to be that Homo sapiens have been, have been running ever since the discovery of farming. We've been in this panic mode ever since, in this prejudice mode, right? Um, so the moral revolution is to know thyself. So we've had all of these now, recently, recent years, we have the know thyself movement, the self-awareness movement, the self-help movement, the mythopoetic movement, right? um, the moral revolution, and um, to heal ourselves. Right? So the, the, the revolution is uh, to heal ourselves. When we heal ourselves, we don't repeat. We can get back the golden ball, I'm okay, you're okay. And then, like Wilson said, we don't need to blindly destroy the environment and the food and all these things, you know. Um, so the outer damaging is because we're ignoring how we felt in, inwardly damaged. If we can face how we were inwardly damaged and understand that greed is an attempt to get back to safety so that we don't feel damaged, uh, then we don't need to repeat. We have some understanding, make new choices, we can, that kind of thing, right? So they sort of go together, TQ2118, um, up to the present, there, there is a bit of a thread there. If you start with TQ2118 up till this video, uh, you'll find a little bit of a continuity there, um, if you read the quotes. Okay, so, okay, so thank you to this artist here. Uh, that's their, the artist ren rendering of Homo Boduensis. Okay, again, just a theory, but um, it's not bad. It's a pretty good theory, I think. Okay, let's um, go, go back to the quotes here. I just saw a crow fly by, but it's not too interesting to keep watching crows, right? But uh, Yeah, we haven't seen the blue jay yet, no eagle. No heron, no Canada geese, not yet, but uh, hopefully we'll see some pretty birds. Uh. Okay, so Fabra was saying, so I, I brought this in because I wanted to replay the, the speech and I thought, if I'm going to replay Wilson's speech, well, let's follow up with some of Faber's material. So he says, greed is an attempt to internalize some sense of being loved by the mother. Greed is an attempt to internalize some sense of having been loved by the mother. It doesn't work, hence the repetition compulsion. Right? You're still trying. You're, it's the it's the constant oscillation between this hope for it and the dread that it's not going to happen. And you hope, dread, hope, dread, back and forth all the time. Repetition compulsion. Okay, repetition compulsion. If there's a trauma, the person wants to recreate, relive, address that place, and get a better outcome or change it or undo it. That's repetition compulsion to try to fix that kind of uh, early trauma but that's a very early trauma baby at the breast how do you how do you heal something so primal like that right? all we can really do is um, become aware of it and okay have some little understanding and maybe we can make better uh, choices and um, we can slowly heal that way and um, if we can talk about it and have symbols for it and have jargon and theories and questions and all of these articles and books and theories, it's an attempt to symbolize it. The idea is that if we can symbolize our psychic pain, it's not so painful anymore. Once we have some kind of concept or memory or symbol or image or some kind of representation of it, that's called binding the excitation. We're binding it, we're, we're grabbing it, this kind of thing. Once we grab our energy, uh, we can we can own it kind of thing, and it's part of us. But if it's just flying around like that within, and it's so painful, uh, 
we're trying to we're trying to bind it. You know? They call it they call it psychic binding, and language is good for that because language and literature and not and uh, is an attempt at that. Right? Um, myths and fairy tales are an attempt at that because they acknowledge the trauma. Myths and fairy tales describe the, the traumatized psyche. So we're very drawn to myths and fairy tales. There's this uncanny appeal to it because our unconscious recognizes it. And we're, we're drawn to it and we're not fully conscious of it. All we have to do is be conscious of it. Goddess and demon means splitting. Yeah. If the... Um, if the if the the, dev the devouring monster means that the baby was enraged and wanted to take in mother's love, that's all it is. So we, we, once we make conscious, um, if we if we provide psychological interpretations to myths and fairy tales, that's very helpful. So that's Robert Bly's work, Marion Woodman, Alan Chinnon, and a few others. Okay, let's move on from greed. Greed is always a difficult topic, right? So greed, so in other words, greed, prejudice, all of that, that's a sign of envy. That's a mirror. Repetition, compulsion, negative magic, gesture, greed, emotion, greed, emotional eating. These are all mirrors. These are all mirrors. If we observe it, we get the idea that we lost the safe bond with the mother. We had an insecure attachment with the mother. It was trauma early on. That's, a, that's, that's, uh, that's by inference. So the inference is that anything other than I'm okay... I'm okay, you're okay, anything other than that. The inference is there's severe trauma early on in childhood. And then we have to go on the, the second journey to heal him. It. It's called the second journey by Chinon. Or, or the hero's journey by Campbell. Um, and, um, and ultimately, you got to be an existential detective, study defense mechanisms, study object relations theory, study the Enneagram, okay, and get to the place where you... Consider how the mother may have had trauma herself and she was caught in her repetition compulsion. Now, if the mother's caught in her repetition compulsion, that means she's in battle with, with the mother in her mind. So the mother didn't get the love from her mother and she's trying to communicate this to her mother in the mind by doing... To, she's going to do to her child what she experienced with her mother as if to say, look, mother in the mind, you see your grandchild here? I'm going to do to your grandchild what you did to me because I want to show you what you did to me. Now, the grandchild didn't get loved. That's called intergenerational trauma, the passing down of the insecure attachment style. So if we recognize this theory of intergenerational trauma, negative magic gesture, um, okay, how trauma is, is a synonym for repetition compulsion about... The loss of the bond means we lost the feelings. That's the trauma we're trying to get about. We're trying to get back our feelings, but it, but in order to get back our feelings, we have to get back the connection. But that's hard to do. Uh, uh, the next best thing is to make I statements with your spouse or partner or best friend. That can that's an authentic relationship. So authentic relating can heal it. Uh, any kind of authentic relationship. That was the message of the movie Groundhog Day. Uh, at the conclusion, it didn't show it very well, but the message was, if you can have an authentic relationship, meaning making I statements, and I gave an example of an I statement maybe two videos ago, I won't do it again here, um, oftener, so that's uh, that's in earlier, earlier videos here. So let's just finish up with Faber here a little bit. Okay, Re because religion keeps infantilism alive, those who challenge it with their alternative claims can make some feel uncomfortable because those claims reach down to where our attachments reside. Okay. So religion is a, is a symptom of trauma. Religion relates to um, the connection to the frightening mother. And the person's not ready to let go of the frightening mother because they're still waiting for, for the frightening mother in the mind to change her ways so that then the person can leave the mother. So religion is a link to the mother, but the, but the frightening mother. So to say that, uh, to, so to, to read Faber's book, a person might be a little, might bring up some anxiety because that means they're going to separate from the mother. But the, maybe they're, that, that, that's anxiety producing. How do you separate from the mother 
when in order to separate from a mother, the child needs her love first, but the baby never got the love first. So how do you separate from it? So these ideas are in this area. That's why many people don't like it, or some people don't like it. Um, but it's liberating because the truth will upset you free. It's liberating. Once you understand it, Faber writes very clearly. He's got three books. Okay, um, The Psychodynamics of Religious Belief, The Psychology of Prayer, and uh, Religion, The Infantilizing Process. Those three books are very clear. Uh, I think that's a very liberating trilogy of books by Faber. That, uh, that first one, uh, the, the Psychodynamics of Religious Belief, uh, that has won a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. You know, if this video uh, suddenly cuts out, th th there will be a part uh, two. I've got limited space here. Okay, another one from Faber here. Okay, in other words, repetition compulsion. In other words, dysfunction, repetition compulsion, greed means you're still stuck with the frightening mother and you're not ready to let go because you're in a catch-22. In order to let go of the mother, you need her love and you're not getting it. And... And the religion is a repetition compulsion of staying stuck with the negative mother. And you can't get out because you need her love. And you're not aware of it, so you're stuck. Okay, so that's uh, the main idea there. That's where the attachments arrive. Okay, attachment. All babies need an attachment. You need the attachment to get your feelings in your golden ball. Okay, the next one here. The anthropomorphization. The anthropo, the anthropomorphism of God. Uh, or God as man, is of absolutely no interest whatsoever to religion, except as it comprises an integral facet of God as parent. We don't approach uh, God, him as one man approaches another man. We approach him as a child approaches a parent. Right? Okay, that's, uh, that's pretty obvious. Okay, one more here. Symbiotic no knowledge. Okay, now Faber, Faber takes... He, he, this next one here is a bit of a stretch. Faber uh, transfers the idea of something... If something's very beautiful in nature, an aesthetic art piece, and, and you fuse with it, it may, it may trigger a little bit the person... In, in, sitting in the building and the guy at the podium there with his hip with his hypnotic dramatic poetic talk triggers the the blissful feeling at the breast maybe a person can do it on their own if they find something really beautiful in nature and they kind of fuse with it or the the image triggers the beauty that the baby felt the beauty with the breast and um, okay so symbiotic knowledge Okay, Fabra calls this the faith state. Okay, so uh, the baby at the breast feels bliss. Uh, the Unico Mystica, this Garden of Eden, the heaven, the manna, the manna, the Wakanda, the manna, the very powerful feeling, and you feel happy and strong and safe and confident. Just the two of us, we can do anything. Love conquers all. This powerful, blissful, happy uh, state. Uh, so Faber gave, uh, borrowed uh, William James. He calls that um, the, the faith state. The purpose of religion is to trigger it, to recreate it. The religion wants to trigger your original faith state. You get a conscious taste of it, and then you say you're a believer. You put money in the basket, and that's the racket. Right? Okay, so symbi symbiotic knowledge, or the faith state, or the mana. Or the Unico Mystica, Garden of Eden. That's called symbiotic knowledge. We have this knowledge. It's implicit. It's pre-verbal, but it's there in the brain. We have this knowledge. Symbiotic knowledge. Now, maybe, Faber says, uh, quoting this other guy here, maybe some beautiful aesthetic object, okay, maybe just basically very, very, um, something that reminds you of the breast, basically. Some beautiful aesthetic object Frequently, um, they may elicit an emotional response from the person who may feel a, quote, a deep subjective rapport. A deep subjective rapport. Like, wow, I feel really, I, I have a special connection with this, uh, 
with this painting or, or, or with this Lamborghini or something, a special subjective rapport. For example, with a painting, maybe a song, a poem, a symphony, a landscape, you know, maybe uh, some people said in Arizona with the red rocks there, they felt that. And um, Sod uh, Sedona, right? Uh, experience, quote, an uncanny, an uncanny fusion. There it is there, right? You, you replayed an uncanny fusion with the item. In other words, at Sedona, you see this beautiful red uh, mountain that's like the breast and you feel this uncanny fusion you feel you feel that's that that this and then you and then you take a photo of the the red rock there at sedona and you think that's uh it triggers you, it triggers your babyhood memory that's called an uncanny fusion with the item or maybe a memory an event can re-evoke okay an event that re so this is so doing this is an event that re-evokes an ego state Okay, a memory, uh, a psychological experience that prevailed dur during early emotional life, psychic life. Quote, it's an uncanny quality. The sense of being reminded of something, quote, never cognitively understood, but existentially known. Right? Existentially known. The baby had the experience of the unico the unico mystica, existentially known, that's symbiotic knowledge, but it's not cognitively, it's not consciously recalled. The aesthetic object or the religious thing uh, triggers that. Then you say you're a believer. I know it. How do you know it? I just feel it. It's uncanny. I really feel this special, one powerful, one beautiful, blissful feeling. Wow, it's really there. So you mean there is this uh, guy in the sky with the beard and all this? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, okay, so they can paint anything in the sky, however, whatever they want. You can use your imagination in any way. The purpose is to evoke the symbiotic knowledge, the faith state, the uncanny fusion. Okay, this existent, what's existentially known. You want to trigger what's existentially known, get a conscious taste of it, and that's called religion. Religion is a conscious experience of living and reliving something you lived as a baby. That's called religion. That's the gambit. It keeps people infantilized like this. Hence the famous quote, uh, the opiate of the people. Because when you're in that blissful state, the oxytocin is there. The serotonin is there. So you're getting that hit. Then, then people um, are hooked on a feeling. Then they, every week they go for that hit because they're hooked on a feeling. And it keeps people infantile because the guy at the podium there, he's not going to talk about psychology. He'll shame psychology. Or he'll put it down and say all these terrible things about it. Because psychology is about healing. Religion is not about not healing. Religion doesn't want you to heal. The purpose of religion is to keep the prejudiced personality. Religion is a tool of the plunder system. We're still in this panic plunder system. right? We don't need to be. We can stop at any time obviously it never need it never needed to happen in, in the first place 10,000 years ago when people discovered farming they could have said whoa this is huge look we, we let's be smart here let, let's manage this but people just panicked my approximate guess is maybe it might be like what if suddenly today everybody on the planet suddenly won a trillion dollars could we cooperate and manage that? I think some people would start to panic, wouldn't it? Because if everyone has a mil if everyone has a trillion dollars, there's going to be this mad shopping spree, and then things will go up, prices will go up, so and then and then you got to band together and you got to defeat others. You see, people are going to panic. It's not necessary. We just <laughs> just let's learn. Let's learn, right? Uh, learn from history. Um, if there's some good, if some good thing happens, let's pause and let's ma ma manage it, um, you know, kind of thing, right? So uh, Kristen Wilson was sort of referencing that. Okay, so that's uh, Fabra there. Twenty, twenty. All of this has, was twenty one forty six. A few ideas from Fabra here, Mel Fabra here. Okay, now since we're on this uh, thread here, um, I'll just continue it a little bit. So the sociological side. Okay. 
the invention of the plunder system, creating the prejudiced personality by traumatizing the children, called the suffer the children. That leads to the us and the them, hence the pool of poorly paid workers. Then the religion reinforces it, entrenches it. Religion blocks healing, because without religion we might heal. The plunder system says, no, don't heal. We want a people. We want people to be have us have prejudice. Prejudice is needed to plunder. So, now, as insurance, uh, to reinforce the religion, there may be propaganda in modern times. Right? Uh, schooling can reinforce it. Cherry picking and conditioning people. Right? So we'll do a, we'll do a couple of quotes on uh, this propaganda topic. Um, um, right. Um, so these are some easy ones. These are older ones from long ago, uh, but they're not bad, some of them. Okay, so let's talk about propaganda a little bit. Okay, propaganda is the employment of a virtue against itself. Meaning, when ideals are misused in a way to tout the very values being violated. Okay, so this relates to double think and um, um, to confuse people. So Dell, we earlier we have an earlier quote from Dell, a college professor. He said about rhetoric. He said um, he said that the slogan they have is a uh, quote: "If you can't baffle them with bull, no, sorry, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, then baffle them with bull." Right? That's how you. That, that was the main idea. If you want to dazzle them with brilliance, uh, they put then that's the infantilizing. And you look up and you think they're the parent and you're the child. If that doesn't work, then confuse them. Now they're down again because they're confused and helpless. They don't understand. Um, so um, one way to confuse people is um, if you're doing something greedy, while you're doing something greedy, you advertise that, that you're doing something generous. So the virtue is generosity, but in your activity of being greedy, you're destroying the virtue of generosity. In the name of generosity, you're being greedy to destroy generosity. So, right? so propaganda um, it confuses people, and uh, then if they're confused, they're passive, they're not going to complain, they're not going to stop, or something like that, because they don't know what's going on. Um, uh, um, Okay, let's see if we can follow up on that one there. Um, okay, next one here. Um, okay, if nearly everyone read this book and used its teachings appropriately, it might help. However, with so much more for propagandists to gain, the book tilts the relationship in their favor. They will work harder at persuading people than people will at protecting themselves. Okay. Um, I include this quote here because I noticed that um, sometimes something educational will be, will be available. But it turns out that knowledge is used against the people, but it was meant to help the people but it tilted in the favor of people using it against the people. So let's say there's a book by the... Let's take, let's take Faber's book. Very few people have read Faber. Now I imagine maybe some people uh, in the plunder system, maybe they read it and used it against people or something. I don't know, I'm just guessing. So he was saying here, uh, here's a very good pro book about propaganda. He was a reviewer for some book about propaganda. I haven't read it, so I don't know about it, but I like the idea. He, he personally liked this book about propaganda. He, he said it was informative. He said, you know, if everybody read this, it would be helpful. It would be more reasonable and intelligent. But he said, wait a minute, very few people are going to read it. Actually, maybe a few people who run the PR things and all that, they're probably going to read it, and they're going to be energized by it, and they're going to use the knowledge against the people. When originally the book was written to help the people, it's being used against them. So he said there's a real uh, pity there about that. Um, um, 
I think some guy wrote a book about uh, the plunder system, but, but the people didn't read it. The only people who read it were administrators of the plunder system. He said, oh my God, I, I wanted to enlighten people, uh, but people didn't read it. And that knowledge <laughs> was like a training manual on how to plunder or something like that. So it's a, it's a, okay, next one here. I don't know how to comment on that. Okay, propaganda is the art of making up the other man's mind for him. Propaganda is the art of making up the other mind's the other man's mind for him. Again, propaganda is the art. Okay, okay uh, the art of making up the other man's mind for him. So you want to find some way to make him be persuaded to, to believe and do things that the propagandist wants you to do. Um, due to space limitations, I don't have this quote in this batch, but I'm sort of reminded of this other quote here. Maybe we can dig it up quickly here. So for example, in relation to that, Okay, for example, how do they do that? Well, if you have an idea to put over, keep presenting it incessantly. Keep talking or printing it persistently. So you just repeat it over and over again. You want to condition people, right? So this is just brain conditioning, classical conditioning. Just repeat it over and over and over. Print it again and again and again. Right? Next, avoid argument. So don't, don't discuss the other side, right? Don't admit that there's another side. Avoid arousing any associated ideas except those which are favorable. So that's uh, selective disattention, cherry picking to support the one side that you're promoting. Connect your idea in every possible way with the known desire of the emotion of the audience. So connect your propaganda to, the, to their childish emotions. Remember that childish emotions and desires and wishes are more often the basis of the acceptance of the ideas than adult reasoning logic. Because the, emotion, the childhood emotions are overwhelming, the hippocampus shuts, the, the, the neocortex shuts down, the amygdala is overstimulated, so your propaganda is, to, is in, to address the amygdala. Use direct statements only when you are sure that a basis for acceptance has already been established. Otherwise, use indirect innuendo, innuendo, Equivocation, double think, okay, etc. Um, implication, imply things, okay. You only use direct statements in such a way that your audience will take it in, but not think too much about it. Well, here's an obvious one. Um, if propaganda is an attempt by somebody to influence somebody else, then it ought to be obvious that the somebody affects the somebody else psychologically, and that therein is undoubtedly the crux of the process of propaganda. Right. So those aren't in there. I didn't have the space. That's sort of like a like an honorable mention backup quote. But, uh, This next one is a little interesting about the English language. Oh, I like it. Yeah, this is a good one. This English language one. She calls it body snatched English. She says that the English, she says that the English language has been body snatched, taken over by, by Iago, the greed of Iago, the Iagos of the world, very traumatized people who focus all of their energy on spreading rumors against others, to put down others, to to express their anger, their greed. Because he, someone like Iago is saying, look, mother in the mind, you see all of this poverty out there? Well, I'm showing you how I feel inside. You gave me this emotional poverty. You didn't love me. I felt poor inside. I created poverty outside to show you how I feel inside. Okay, so the PR guy um, is usually an Iago type, let's say or some bitter type. Burglar says most advertising people, PR people, they have a contempt for peep others. Right? 
uh, they're angry at other they're angry at their mother and um, they want to sh- they want um, they have this fantasy that maybe the mother and the mind can change her ways if they can convince the mother and the mind of what um, okay so what um, the mother and the mind represents the mother so if they can convince the mother uh, through the mother and the mind image imago what the mother did to him maybe he thinks the mother will change her ways it's as if the fantasy might be that the phantom the memory of the mother will fly out of the person's mind iago's mind travel to where the mother is make the mother realize that she didn't breastfeed and didn't hold the baby and use the use the schedule and the bottle and the made the baby cry at night maybe she punished the baby ignored the baby never no skin to skin contact no play no seeing no looking no joy you know just uh, kept the guy alive but didn't really no emotional needs so maybe maybe the um, the fantasy is that the, the memory of the mother in the mind will travel to the the rejecting mother get her to change her ways get her to realize her mistake she gets a huge revelation and picks up the phone and calls immediately and apologizes and maybe they can do some healing that way that's not going to happen but that's maybe iago's uh, unconscious hope that he can show through his behavior, something externally that represents how he feels by the mother, with the hope that the mother will get the message and change her ways. Right? So this guy, so let's stick with Iago here. He's going to use the English language and infuse it with his anger. Now it's called the body snatched English. So now propaganda is body snatched English. So now the English has double think, innuendo, flip-flopping, uh, all of this um, subtle references to mean that, that cancels that, uh, condensation, uh, this implies that, this cancels that out, equivocation, you meant that, no, you meant that, did you think that, no, I meant that, it's, there's the body snatcher, the language has been body snatched, so in propaganda is called, she calls a body snatched English, right? so you might think, uh, so she so she puts it this way here. Okay, so the English language has facilitated the sharing of information. Okay, fair enough. But when it comes to communication, okay, uh, Kovrig argues that the type of English that is used, the type of English that is used leads to misunderstandings, double entendres, subtle manipulation of others okay so the way we're using the english language leads to confusing them tricking them lying to them etc through using logical fallacies rhetoric uh, equivocation etc so for example familiar words familiar words were used but with dubious and new meanings in order to point toward certain goals. So you can't take the words at face value because you don't, most people take the words at face value. Well, what do you mean by that word? Well, he'll lie. He'll change, he'll mean something else. Well, what do you mean by that word? And then he'll shame you for it. And then you don't question anymore. You see? So this body snatched English, that's quite a phrase right there. I've never heard that one before. That's a good one. Body snatched English. Uh, the English language invaded by the body. <laughs> the English was body snatched. That's a good one. Okay, this body snatched English, meaning propaganda. Okay, rhetoric. It's body snatched English. Is the subject of her study in her book. So this was a reviewer. Okay, talking about uh, Karen Kovig. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, Kovrig's not Dobrik. K O Kovrig's. A book. Her, her book is called Road to Propaganda, colon, The Semantics of Biased Communication. The semantics, okay, the meaning of prejudiced communication, tricky communication. What's the grammar and the meaning? How do we understand uh, tricky communication? For example, um, if you mislead somebody, well, that's a lie. Okay, according to uh, Cecilia or Cicella, oh, sorry, Cicella, Cicella Bach. So according to Cicella Bach, a lie is an intentionally deceptive message in the form of a statement. So you say something, 
But your purpose is for the other person to misunderstand you and mislead them. Well, why don't we call that a lie? She says, well, in effect, that's a lie. If that's the intention, then you're lying. But maybe people can argue, no, that's not a lie. I just said that. It's not my fault if you believe that, but you, but you led me to believe that. She says, no, come on, let, let, let's be fair here. That's a lie, she says. So I'm sure that's a big debate here, this one here, about Cecilia Bach. This one here, by the way, this book is 1957. I can't find it. Uh, very, It's unavailable. Real pity. There's only one copy around for $100. Uh, it's, only, it's a short book. Okay, the road, uh, it's called Road to Propaganda. It's just a tiny little booklet, but they want $100 for it. So I don't have it. There's no online copy of it. So we don't really have it there. But we do have the gem here of the phrase. The propaganda is body snatched English. All right? Communication that tricks you, that misleads you. Okay, rhetoric misleads you. Logical fallacies, that's body snatched English. Um, another guy here um, was talking about propaganda in newspapers. Okay, so this guy here, John G. Speed, uh, long ago, uh, that, this was very old, like a, like 200 years ago, maybe no, maybe 100, and, maybe 100 plus years ago he wrote this. He concluded that, that uh, new journalism, quote unquote, okay, meaning the invention of propaganda, Okay, had injected high levels of gossip and scandals by the muckrakers. Okay, the new material adversely affected readers in two ways. Number one, it displaced useful news. It took it, it took away useful news. It took away something that's going to help you. There's something that's useful. It's gone. There's no space for it. Right. So we got rid of what's useful. It displaced it. Right. And in its place. We put in just uh, gossip stuff, okay? Now, the muckrakers provided examples of poor behavior that readers might imitate. So young people reading all of this rubbish, they might, be, they might imitate it, right? This, this is actually a very old quote. So long ago, this was pointed out, right? Muckrakers, and... Um, Muck ra uh, muckrakers, pardon me. Now that term muckrakers, it depends on the context of how you mean it. But generally speaking, uh, you're overly focused on finding um, something embarrassing about uh, others. Uh, celebrity gossip, that's the mud raking, and everybody's all excited about that. Because the, um, the dark side of the celebrity, um, people can project their disowned material onto them. And so there's a fascination that way. So there's a lot of emotionality with celebrity gossip. You know, uh, this movie star had an affair with this other person, with this other third person. And they may have the fantasy of the memory of their Maybe they wish they could have an affair. And they, the celebrity had an affair. So there's a lot of emotionality about mud raking. And because of all this emotionality, people focused on this. And the cost of it is, Number one, people became energized to become mud rakers, searching for the mud and the muck and all that, uh, because, of, because of the appeal and because of the mass in interest. And then from that, people read this and think, is that what this is all about? Just, just, just uh, uh, trigger people's unconscious emotions and they're fascinated by some uncanny feeling there, just trigger people's uncanniness, like religion you had an uncanny feeling, you want to trigger the uncanny feeling. Is that all it is? So people are uh, overly focused on gossip. So they may, have, they may, in order to get gossip, they may be rude in things. They may make up things. They may lie about things. They may distort things. Equivocation, mislead, uh, cherry pick, um, avoid the context. And you don't have the context. And what you see is out of context. And that leads you to think in another way. So they're always doing these kinds of tricks. And people might, and the young person reading this, What's journalism? Where's knowledge? What's this is not useful? Maybe so. Maybe they think that's that's what writing. That's what life is about. Something. Yeah. Number two, the other disadvantage is that uh, we don't have the necessary knowledge for, to improve our spirit. Yeah. Now, unless the mud raker, unless the journalist can put some psychology there, 
Dear reader, you're so fascinated with uh, this movie star's uh, antics uh, or something. When you were a child, did you act like that or something? Maybe they can work with it or something. It's called shadow work, you know. So maybe there's an opportunity there or something like that. But um, now, to some degree, it's maybe useful if there is a scandal that you want to know about it. But uh, but to a limit, you know. But some people say it's gone it's gone way over the top, and all you read is tabloid stuff, and it's made up stuff and. Uh, and people are getting paid to find made up stuff. People are even making up stuff, and they're getting paid for it. And, and you know, it's 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 too much, and it's um, we're li we're missing out on what's useful for our spirit and our human development, for our human growth. So that was uh, this quote came out at the beginning of the time of prop. Uh, the, oh, sorry, this quote came out at the invention of the news press. He said propaganda has always been around, but when the news press came, then this new thing came up called the mud rackers, something like that. I'll see if I can follow up on that one. Okay, okay, let's take a break from propaganda. Um, I'm not really focused on this topic, to be honest with you. Um, it's it's. To me, propaganda and advertising, I think Burglar's right. He said prop PR, propaganda, it's it's a contempt for people. It's not respecting people. It's lying to people, deceiving people. You know. Um, doesn't want to share honestly what's going on. And um, because it's part of the plunder system. Propaganda, religion, schooling, uh, a lot of these things are part of the plunder system. All of these things uh, feed in to the prejudiced personality because that's what's needed uh, for the plunder system and the plunder system is this blind manic panic from the trauma of too much stimulation of serotonin that that is traumatizing because we can't handle that so we panicked in response you don't want the baby to be flooded right like you don't want the baby to get too much stimulation we got a lot of winning a trillion okay now I'm stuck a little bit. If somebody won a trillion dollars, that wouldn't be traumatic, would it? It shouldn't be. But maybe collectively, it had some effect to that effect. I'll have to think about it. Okay, um, let's move on to transference here. Okay, analysis of transference. Okay, something in the past, you put it onto the somebody in the present. You 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 see your unloved self onto somebody in the present. So you transfer, you project the past into the present. When the past, when the present is past, when the past is present. Okay, so transference is a time distortion there. Okay, if we talk about transference, in other words, your wife is not your mother. If you think your wife is your mother, that's your transference. Okay, transfer. Transference makes it possible to demonstrate to the client how he or she has cast the analyst in an unconscious scenario of his or her creating. A scenario that originated in the client's conflicts during childhood. If a person is able to make genuine contact with another people, then he or she would treat the other person as a unique individual and no transference would occur. So that's, that's the journey. Right? If the client sees the therapist as a parent, that's transference. But if finally they can be like a cooperative team, uh, two adults, uh, then that, that's a, a more in the present realistic relationship. Then they can heal repetition compulsion. Transference and repetition compulsion are, are synonymous. If a person is transferring, that's repetition compulsion. The baby was traumatized with the mother. They transfer the mother onto somebody in the present. So that, that repetition compulsion, uh, transference is a, an arm of it. It, it is, it's a manifestation of represent, representation. Transference is a, a representation of repetition compulsion. So we could say that transference and trauma are synonymous. Right. Okay, I'll just start to wind down here. Okay, the next one uh, from one of our mentors, Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. 
Um, I thought this was sort of slightly on the lighter note, but maybe not so much. This is about fashion. Okay. Um, so, th uh, th 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 we're talking about fashion long ago, right? Okay. Clothes which make a woman's life difficult and handicap her and handicap her in competition with men are always felt to be attractive, sexually attractive. So his theory, so she was saying long ago that um, men were fashion designers, but they would restrict the women's mobility. Um, the, the, the clothing was too tight. Uh, it, um, the high heels, I think they couldn't run. They wouldn't be very mobile or something. Um, it was maybe painful. It would restrict them. It, it would like limit them. It would like control them in a way. Then the men felt safe. The men felt safe, then they felt more comfortable, then they felt more allure, allured if the woman is safe, that kind of thing. So clo fashion was an, an attempt to make women attractive, but how do, you, how, do men how do men feel attracted by women? Well, if they feel safe with her, how do men feel safe with the woman? Well, if they invent all of these complicated clothes, like very tight this and tight that, and it constricts the woman, and maybe she doesn't, she doesn't, have, she doesn't have much mobility, or maybe... So that's just sort of the theory about it. I don't, I'm not really into this, but um, anyways, fashion designing will probably become more and more the domain of women, okay? And women are much more realistic about the clothes they wear than men. In other words, you don't want men to design women's clothes. You want women to design women's clothes. Because if men design women's clothes, it's going to be painful for women, right? Oh yeah, the, the the example was the corset, right? It's tight; they can't breathe. They're going to be still. They're not going to those kinds of those kinds of things. Okay. Accordingly, one would uh, also guess that uh, the beauty and utilitarian element in their clothes will become more and more prevalent. The rebellion against the hat, in part. It is part and parcel of the general feminine trend towards greater ease. Meaning less constriction. So the fashion constricted, so long ago, fashion would constrict the woman. She had the hat and the corset and this was tight. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, and uh, the hair was all tight or so, I don't know. Okay, um, again, the rebellion against the hat for example, so the one example was the hat. See, women don't wear hats so much now, right? The rebellion against the hat is part and parcel of the general feminine trend towards greater ease, meaning less constriction in dress generally. Fashion is now paying the penalty for its cruelty toward women. So Edmund Burglar wrote 24 books. One of them is about fashion. No, I wouldn't reckon. Edmund Burglar has some great material, great books. The fashion one, I'm not really. That's maybe the least um, of interest. Yeah. Um, if you're going to start to read Edmund Burglar, uh, don't start with the fashion book. Start with um, any of his other books. Yeah. Divorce won't help. That might not be. T Tension can be reduced to nuisances. That's a good place to start. That's a very good place to start. It's a little pocketbook for the general public. Tension can be reduced to nuisances. Uh, or divorce won't help. There's another one called uh, Unhappy Marriage. That one there. Um, his main book is called The Basic Neurosis. So the child wants to bond to his mother. The mother's rejecting. There's pain there. Now, the, remember, the baby's very happy with his pleasure to bond to his mother, but the mother's rejecting. So there's a blurring there. So the pleasure gets mixed in with the displeasure. So Burglar says, that's we've got to look at this issue. Right? He calls it the, the libidinalization of guilt or pain. So we've, we've infused pleasure in the pain. So later on, we may do something dysfunctional, it's painful, and it unconsciously triggers some covert, uncanny pleasure that we once had. So people may be dysfunctional because maybe unconsciously they're going to seek for a little bit of that forgotten pleasure because, because the pleasure got mixed in with the pain. Right? Um, 
that, that takes some time to go through that one. Um, but no one's aware of it. So they they do something, they do some alternative activity that's dysfunctional. And they blame the alternative, they blame the, they call it the rescue station, or the pseudo-aggressive, this, this uh, other, this secondary thing. They do this other, like emotional eating, for example. That's dysfunctional. But they get some uncanny, they, they get a little, they get a little unconscious pleasure from it. Uh, but the idea is not to th link it. The, the idea is to keep it in the realm of emotional eating. Just talk about the symptom, face the symptom. Um, but Bergler says you got to trace it back to the earlier period of where the child's pleasure and rejection got blurred, blurred together. He has a whole theory about this. I won't go into it here. But he wrote about the psychology of money. Oh my goodness, yeah, I don't have that book. It's unavailable. See, a lot of good books are not being uploaded. Like that one, like that book here today just mentioned. What a pity. See, this book's not available, right? Which one is it? All right, the Kovrig one. See, this book's not available. Road to Propaganda, The Semantics of Biased Communication by uh, K Karen uh, Kovrig. Not available, right? Burglar's book about the psychology of money. Not available. Okay, last one here. About, about uh, back to Burglar here. Okay, uh, one uh, reviewer. Uh, in the preface to this book, uh, Fashion and the Unconscious, the, the, the guy who wrote the preface to it said, the syndicated newspaper columnist, a columnist uh, uh, Dorothy uh, Kilgallen, Apparently she was like Dear Abby, or she was very famous in the 50s. Um, so she, she was like a rock star uh, newspaper journalist back in the 50s. So this woman here, this syndicated column, columnist, uh, wrote in 1953, quote, Seventh Avenue will flip when Dr. Edmund Burglar's book, Fashion and the Unconscious, is published. But, actu but in actuality, this book can strike a chord on every avenue, on every street, everywhere. And his point was, any man who feels overly uh, attracted by women who wear very painful clothing, uh, very tight uh, this and that, and, uh, maybe this book can a little bit help ex explain it. Okay, let's just take a little peek out here. And we can see this nowadays with women. They're, they're wearing very relaxed clothing now. Um, they just want to be comfortable, utilitarian clothing. Burglar predicted back in the 50s when he wrote this book that women are going to search for a balance between beauty and comfort. And that's in rebellion to all of the men long ago who got women, who got women to wear uh, corsets and uh, push-up bras, I guess, and, uh, and uh, maybe they had to pluck their eyebrows or do all of these fancy things. Um, so he's saying, he said here, um, what did he say here? Fashion is now paying the penalty for its cruelty toward women. Now women are rebellion. No, I'm going to wear something relaxed and uh, clean and tidy and uh, looks good, but it's relaxed at the same time. I'm not going to wear this exaggerated. I'm not going to make myself look like some kind of stilted uh, stone statue uh uh, just to facilitate your imagination, because if I'm a stone statue, uh, maybe you think uh, it's safe and you feel better about yourself. Well, uh, that's uh, women. W women want their freedom. Actually, Dolly Parton made some jokes about it. You know, she's <laughs> John... <laughs> Dolly Parton says, "You have no idea how expensive it is to make me look the way I do." 
<laughs> the way she said it was kind of funny. Um. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe we'll just end up, uh, let's look for a song here. Well, hold on a sec. Um, let's, let's close up with a song here. What do you want to hear? Um, okay, let's, um, Let's see. Castle by the Sea. That's not a bad song. Castle by the Sea. We haven't played Anne Shell in such a long time. Yeah, we could play Anne Shell. Devram Kaya. Oh my God. Okay, let's play Devram Kaya's song called Huma Kusu. We haven't played this song in such a long time. You know what? At the very beginning of this uh, project, I played her song. And I haven't played it since. So yeah, let, let's let's play. This is a great song by Devrim Kaya. That that's her last name, K A Y A, and the song is called Huma Kusu. What a great song! So we'll end up with this song here.
You know, I was just thinking about that aesthetic idea. He did include songs. In that quote, they said maybe a song can be aesthetic. So maybe at some unconscious level, I feel an uncanny connection of the memory of being one with uh, the mother, right? So maybe that song uh, uh, evokes some of that. If it does, then we say the song is aesthetic. Uh, if a beautiful scene does it, um, a waterfall or a, a meadow or lots of flowers or a mountain, or, uh, yeah, fill in the blank. Right? Um, so where's that quote again? Hold on a sec. Let's dig that up again. Right, aesthetic objects. Right, symbiotic knowledge. So maybe that song for me triggers some of my symbiotic knowledge, symbiotic memory. It's implicit knowledge. It's not conscious knowledge. It's it's preverbal, implicit, unconscious knowledge. It's called symbiotic knowledge. So aesthetic objects. Okay, whatever it may be, a, a song, a poem, a painting, uh, an opera, a landscape, uh, an experience. And, and, and if, if you get some experience of an uncanny fusion, if you feel like a very close connection with it, uh, and you have a very positive feeling about it, maybe it re-evokes um, some of that early life. That's just a theory. I, I honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, there's an uncanny quality to it, right? Uh, the sense of being reminded of something never cognitively apprehended, but existentially known. So we could basically argue, in that case, any song that you like maybe has this effect. Any song that you, you like, oh, I love this song, uh, maybe that has that effect. We can say it's aesthetic in the way it's being defined here. Right. Do another song here. Why don't we do one more song here? We got Cashton, yeah. Um, the Drifters. That's some good song. Ili Sapi, yeah. We've played lots of Gabriel already, yeah. <laughs> you know the TV show uh, Route 66? Uh, they wanted to make a sequel to it. They, they never did it. But uh, somebody was uh, tasked to, pro to provide the, the theme song if they were to have a sequel. So he here's, here's what would have been... This song is what would have been the theme song to, to a sequel of uh, Route 66. This one, yeah. Did you ever look out your window to see what was down below, where the four winds blow? I'm a refugee from the mansion on the hill And if you don't need me, I'll find somebody who will Okay, again, that's a fun song. It's only one minute long. See, that song's talking about repetition compulsion. The character in the song says that when he was a child, he felt abandoned. Now, in the present, he's going to look for people who, who will abandon him. So he said in the song, if you're not going to abandon me, I'm going to find someone who will. He's looking for people. He's unconsciously looking for 
partners, friends in the present who will abandon, who will leave him because he's trying to master the original trauma of being left by the mother. So he said in the song explicitly, if you're not going to leave me, I'm going to find someone who will. But listen carefully again to the end. It's a great line, very psychologically minded. Yeah, he's stuck in the repetition compulsion. He, he he expects too much. No person in the present can fuse with him, so that he can get his feelings back. That's a one-time deal. Babyhood. That was a one-time deal. No one in the present can do it. The exception is if he has an authentic dialogue with somebody. He can. Um, create some new neural networks and create a new, uh, healthier um, way of thinking and interacting that layers over uh, the dysfunctional neural networks. Now, he may under stress revert to the old neural networks, but he can build some new neural networks that are healthier. Right? That's the best thing maybe um, he can do. Right? Unless he goes through the mourning process. Right? If he can um, um, forgive the mother, uh, recognize the situation, feels feels safe doing it, uh, and really have a good cry about it, um, and then reach some acceptance through the knowledge and understanding, then if he gets to that emotional acceptance, yeah, then he, he he's uh, he's good. Maybe one more here. Okay, Karunesh, Jose Feliciano, uh, Melanie Thompson, motherless child. Hell is, for, yeah, Hell is for Children, Pat Benatar. Yeah, that's a good song. You know, we've never played this song here. Let's play this one here. Niha Shilhozo by the band uh, XIT. Here's a... We've never played this song before. I've always wanted to play it. So let's just play it now. Um, from the 70s. It's, uh, it's called I Am About You. It's just a simple love song. From the band X, is that right? X I T is it pronounced Exit? Um, I'm not sure. It's an indigenous group, but I'm not sure which uh, which group it is. So there's the title of the song. Niha Shil Hojo. I am about you. Means I, I love you, basically. I'm crazy about you. Oh, 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 
So thanks very much. This has been TQ 2146 to 2152. We'll add more quotes on propaganda. Um, I didn't really cover it very well in this video. I feel a little badly about that. I'd like to improve on that in future videos. I think the main takeaway message about propaganda is the idea of the body snatched English, that the English language is body snatched. So in other words, English is now body snatched um, in terms of um, what's, what's coming through the airwaves primarily. Right? In other words, advertisers and PR people and all this, they've taken the English language and um, co-opted it, uh, it got body snatched, and now their agenda is embedded within the English language, so the English language is used to further uh, their agenda. Now what's their agenda? Right? Their psychology, what's their psychology? Greed, envy, etc. Right? The body snatched English. Interesting phrase. Right. Hopefully this book will make an appearance. Again, Road to Propaganda, the, the Semantics of Biased Communication. Right. And um, we'll talk more about transference. If you have a genuine relationship, 
you can end the transference, right? If a person is able to make genuine contact with another person, then he or she would treat that other person as a unique person in their own right, and no transference would occur. If you can get to that place, of whole object rating, you're not going to transfer. The reason you're transferring is because you're trying to find out for yourself that you have a lot of pain from childhood. Transference means trauma. If you're transferring and you're projecting, that's trauma. Prejudice is, is confession of trauma. Right? Projection, transference, these are these are confessions of trauma. Right? So if you can... <laughs> be aware of it, uh, that might help you to relate to someone as a separate person. Now you have a more genuine contact when you do so. Now making I statements is, is the, the pathway to do it. Right? I'm sorry, I don't know much about the, the fashion and the unconscious one. So I, I just uh, kept it sort of brief there. But uh, I, I want to promote Edmund Burglar's work. Edmund Burglar. Um... You know, uh, 24 books, 300 papers. Yeah, Edmund Burglar said it here as well. An effort to internalize the maternal object. So greed is an attempt to have within your brain some experience of loving memories with the mother. But it doesn't work. And you try again and again and again. And if we're not aware of it, we're just going to do it again and again. But if you're aware of it, oh my God, you're... you're <laughs> You realize how ridiculous it is, and you're sacrificing the present for some kind of childhood nursery battle you can't win in the present. So you think, oh, and then you're free a little bit. So you kind of feel relieved a little bit. And, and, and this awareness can help to free you from the rejecting mother. Consciousness can lead to emotional freedom, right? Otherwise, you become addicted, all right? And... Um, you see, we talked, okay, these, I won't go over Faber's ones here, but uh, another phrase here, symbiotic knowledge. So the two key uh, takeaway messages here, I, I would say is symbiotic knowledge. That's a good one, symbiotic knowledge. And uh, this one here about the, the body snatched English, body snatched English. English is gone. We only have body snatched English. Put it that way. All right. Um, that, that's, that's, uh, that's an important concept, I think. What do you think? One last one here. You know, I was thinking I might play some street heart. Okay, this will be the last song, I promise. Star's a great song. Nature's Way. Storytellers are good. Here's an underappreciated song by the rock band Street Heart. This one's called Storyteller.
You know, I was just thinking. Oh, are we still recording? Hold on a sec. Are we still recording? This, oh, this is gonna cut out. I got a message, this is gonna end. Just one final comment. This, um, this reminds me. You see, this could be symbiotic knowledge here, right? They're kind of, they're close, they're intimate, they're together, almost like they're one. So this image could be aesthetic because it triggers the memory of oneness, you see? So I was just thinking that this uh, painting here, for me, might be an aesthetic object because it triggers...